Well, it's good to have you here. Um, we are continuing on forging ahead in our Fear of the Lord, Cultivating a Healthy Fear of the Lord series. Um, next week, we're going to be having our corporate uh, prayer time, so I'd invite you all to come out to that. I think those times are vitally important. And we talk about equipping. Um, it's not just knowledge base. It's, it's being equipped by being led by the Spirit. Um, and so getting together to pray you know, and seeking the Lord's face together um, as a church is, is vitally important for us. And so I'd invite you all back for next week for our uh, corporate prayer time. And that will be led by one of our elders. Um, and uh, so, yeah, let's go ahead and pray. And then we, there's some really good stuff that I think we're going to get into today. And uh, well, let's ask the Lord's blessing to bless the teaching ministry of His Word. God, we pray that as we open up um, our minds and our hearts to receive all that you have for us today, whether it's in this equipping hour at Faith University or whether it's in the worship gathering itself, um, that you would communicate truth to us and that our hearts would resound with, uh, with joy as we hear these things being spoken of. And God, I pray that we'd be able to recover um, kind of a prominence of who you are um, and that this morning that you would be blessed in revealing this truth to us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, um, so we are, we're going to continue on. This is session five of Cultivating a Healthy Fear of the Lord. Uh, I don't really want to run through a lot of the review stuff. You kind of know where we've been at, but we talked about how the fear of the Lord, the do not fear command, week one was a very prominent theme we see all throughout the scriptures. Week two is in order for the church to expand in their discipleships and evangelism efforts, we need to cultivate having a healthy fear of the Lord. And we talked about it in th week three. Sometimes we diminish who our God really is. We have these false perceptions of who our God is. And so last week when we got together, we tried to talk about the real deal, who really is our God. And we're going to actually continue that on today um, as we talk about who really our God is. And what we want to talk about is we need to understand <clears throat> the, uh, if my clicker is going to work here, all of a sudden it was working, now it's not. Rats. Um, Shane, do you know if, oh, there it is. Can you see if we got a little uh, AAA battery somewhere? Thank you. Um, the prominence of our God. And what I mean by prominence is like the, his outstandingness, um, his, his uniqueness, his, uh, some of the words could say famous, like he's, he's above everything else. And so um, I've been teasing this out from week two in the series, and we're finally going to be able to fill in that little blank, all right, from, from C.S. Lewis's retelling of um, the creation story of the creation of Narnia. And so finally we'll get here, okay? Um, sorry, it's been long and delayed, but I love the way <clears throat> that C.S. Lewis captures this moment as the children are, are entering into a new world that was dark, formless, formless and void, and this is what happens. It says this, Hush, said the cabbie, and they all listened. All right, if you could put that in there, that'd be wonderful, thanks. Um, so they, they, were, they were in our world, and then they put the yellow rings or green rings on, I forget which one it was, and they, they entered in the woods between the worlds and entered into a new world, and they drew some humans in with them. It says, hush, said the cabbie, and they all listened. And in the darkness, something was happening at last. A voice had begun to sing. It was very far away, and Diggory found it hard to decide from what direction it was coming. Sometimes it seemed to come from all directions at once, and sometimes he almost thought it was coming out of the earth beneath them. Its lower notes were deep enough to be the voice of the earth herself. There were no words, there was hardly even a tune, but it was, beyond comparison, the most beautiful noise that he had ever heard. It was so beautiful that he could hardly bear it. The horse seemed to like it too. He gave a sort of whinny, and the horse would, or he gave a sort of whinny a horse would give if, after years of being a cab horse, it found itself back in the old field from where it had played as a fowl, and saw someone from it remembered and loved coming across the field to bring it a lump of sugar. He says, "God," said the cabbie, "ain't it lovely?" Then two wonders happened all at the same moment. One was that the voice was suddenly joined by other voices, more voices than you could possibly count. They were in harmony with it, but far higher up the scale, cold and tingling, silvery voices. The second wonder was that the blackness overheard, overhead all at once was blazing with stars. They didn't come out gently one by one as they do on a summer evening. One moment there had been nothing but darkness, the next moment a thousand, 
thousand points of light leapt out, single stars, constellations, and planets, brighter and bigger than any of ours in our world. There were no clouds. The new stars and the new voices began at exactly the same time. If you had seen it and heard it as Diggory did, you would have felt quite certain that it was the stars themselves which were singing, and that it was the first voice, the deep one, which had made them appear and make them sing. Glory be, said the cabbie. I'd have been a better man all my life if I'd have known there are things like this. The voice on the earth was now louder and more triumphant, but the voices in the sky, after singing loudly with it for a time, began to get fainter, and now something else was happening. Far away and down near the horizon, the sky began to turn gray. A light wind, very fresh, began to stir. The sky in that one place grew slowly and steadily, steadily paler. You could see shapes of hills standing up against it, and all the time the voice went on singing. There was soon light enough for them to see one another's faces. The cabbie and the two children had open mouths and shining eyes, and they were drinking in the sound, and they looked as if it reminded them of something. Uncle Andrew's mouth was open too, but not open with joy. He was the skeptic. He looked more as if his chin had simply dropped away from the rest of his face. His shoulders were stooped and his knees shook. He was not liking the voice. If he could have gotten away from it by creeping into a rat's hole, he would have done so. But the witch looked as if, in a way, she understood the music better than any of them. Her mouth was shut, her lips were pressed together, and her fists were clenched. Ever since the song began, she had felt that this whole world was full of a magic different from hers and stronger. She hated it. She would have smashed that world, or all worlds, to pieces <clears throat> if it would only stop the singing. The horse stood with its ears well forward and twitching. Every now and then it snorted and stamped the ground. It no longer looked like a tired old cab horse. You could now well believe that its father had been in battles. The eastern sky changed from white to pink and from pink to gold, and the voices rose and rose till all the air was shaking with it. And just as it swelled to the mightiest and most glorious sound it had ever produced, the sun rose. Diggory had never seen such a sun. The sun above the ruins of Charn had looked older than ours. This looked younger. You could imagine that it laughed for joy as it came up. And as its beam shot across the land and travelers could see for the first time what sort of place they were in, it was a valley through which the broad, swift river wound its way, flowing eastward toward the sun. Southward there were mountains, northward there were lower hills, but it was a valley of mere earth, rock, and water. There was not a tree, not a bush, not a blade of grass to be seen. The earth was of many colors. They were fresh, hot, and vivid. They made you feel excited until you saw the singer himself, and then you forgot everything else. Everything in all of creation in this new world that C.S. Lewis was trying to paint for us, they said all of it paled in comparison. Like all the beauty that you saw, all the beauty that Diggory and his you know, brothers and sisters found, they saw all the created world and like they couldn't believe it. They said, I would have been a better man all my life if I would have known such wonders were out there when you looked at the beauty of this creation. But then it says this, they made you feel excited when you look at the wonders of creation until you saw the singer himself and then you forgot everything else. And so who's the singer? Well, it was Aslan, right? C.S. Lewis goes on to say, it was a lion, huge, shaggy, and bright, stood facing the risen sun. Its mouth was wide open and song, and it was about 300 yards away. Everything else and all the creation, all the jaw-dropping, stunning things that were coming into existence couldn't hold a candle to the singer himself. What C.S. Lewis is trying to capture here is that God is incomprehensible. God is infinite. And though he created everything and we're like amazed by it, like when we gaze at who our God actually is, like our jaws just drop. The finite creature has a hard time understanding infinity. If you want smoke to start pouring out of your ears, try to think of something that had no beginning, right? Have you ever just like sat there and just wondered like, what is it like to have no beginning? What type of entity would that be? Well, that's a holy entity. That's a prominent entity. 
And so we talked about it last week when he talked about the holiness of God, and we must recover an awe for God himself. If we are going to make any advance in this world as, as his kingdom children, as subject of the king, we need to recover this awe. And so that's what we want to try to do today. Look at Psalm 29. I just want to read through this psalm to you and show you something that is absolutely amazing at the end of it. It says this, Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due His name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. So what should we be doing here at the very first two verses? What is David trying to tell us to do? Worship or what? Yeah. Ascribe, right? It's like, hey, there, there's a being there that, that is deserving and worthy of something from you. And it's not just, the, it's heavenly beings, it's, it's, it's people, right? It's all of the creation worshiping the Lord in the splendor of His holiness. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders the Lord over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon to skip like the calf in Syrian, like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord flashes forth flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness, and the Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. I love this part. The voice of the Lord makes the deer give birth and strips the forest bare, and all in His temple cry out, Glory. It's the word for weightiness. Like, this is heavy. Kavod is the Hebrew word. Like, God is like, I love it, God is likened to a thunderstorm by David here. Like, this God is wild, uncontrollable, like, powerful. And when you have an encounter with Him, like the rest of all creation, you cry out, Holy, 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 glory. There's a heaviness, there's a weightiness, there's a prominence to who our God is. Paul David Tripp says this, Every awesome thing in creation is designed to point you to the one who alone is worthy of capturing and controlling the awe of your searching and hungry heart. When you look at the creation, it was beautiful this morning, right? Like there's like fog, there's mist, there's frost, there's a beautiful sunrise, there's mountains, there's silhouettes, all that type of stuff, the fall colors. It's amazing, all of that, when you look at the creation, don't forget about the Creator. That's what Psalm 29 is telling us. Don't be so infatuated with all these things and forget about the singer himself that brought those things into existence. All of what we see in the creation reveals glory, but all of that glory we see here is not to be compared with the beauty that we behold when we see the singer himself. And so to show the wonder and the beauty and the mercy and the love, the singer himself stepped into our time and space as the word that was made flesh and he dwelt among us. He died for us. He rose again to life for us to show us in a very special way who he is. And people, we cannot become casual with him. We can't be casual with our knowledge of him or in the way that we relate with him. So I want to contemplate with, with C.S. Lewis a little bit more. Okay, this might be a little bit more of a familiar story if you've read *Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe*, right? Think about the the, the Pevensey's experience at Mister and Missus Beaver's house. Remember when they're on the run from Queen Jadis, the evil queen that was turning everything into stone? Always winter, but never what? Ah, that'd be horrible, right? So, so they're on the run. They're in the woods. Mister Beaver meets them, and he says that he might be able to help them on their journey. And he invites them to like his little beaver dam here, this little, this little spot in the woods, a little refuge. And they go and he makes them dinner. Mr. Beaver confirms that Tumnus was taken away by the secret police. Mr. Beaver tells them that there's nothing that they can do except go to Aslan. All right? And so the children beg to hear more about who Aslan is. And Mr. Beaver tells them that Aslan is the king of Narnia and that he's the rightful king of Narnia. Queen Jadis was pretending, right? as opposed to the witch who is masquerading as the queen, right? So they said, you, didn't, you can't do anything except go to Aslan. He's the king. And Susan asked, asked Mrs. Beaver, Mr. Beaver, if 
Aslan is a man because she's starting to get confused. Like you're talking about this entity and I'm not quite sure. She asks him, is he a man? And Mr. Beaver tells her quite sternly that he's not a man. He says he is a lion. He is the king of beasts. And this is what Susan says. Oh, I don't have it there. I think it's on your quote there. Oh, said Susan. I thought he was a man. Is he quite safe? I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. And this is what Mrs. Beaver says. That you will, dearie. Make no mistake, right? If there's anyone who can appear before Aslan without their knees knocking, they're either braver or than most or else just silly. Then he isn't safe, said Lucy. And Mr. Beaver said, don't you hear what Mrs. Beaver tells you? Who said anything about safe? Of course he's not safe, but he's good. He's the king, I tell you. So what is C.S. Lewis trying to communicate here in this little encounter? What do you think C.S. Lewis is trying to communicate to us as readers and initially to his grandchildren, right? What's he trying to say about who our God is? What's that? Don't take him frivolously, right? Don't be trivial with him. Yeah, what else? Yeah, he's the king of beasts, right? Yeah, what were you saying? He's He's the king. He's the king. You don't mess with a king, right? What else do you see? He could be trusted because of what? His character, right? He appeals to his character, right? Because of his goodness. So Aslan is dangerous and frightening, right? And yet he can be trusted, is what Lewis is trying to communicate here. And we just get this by reading just the scene at face value. There's a basic visceral fear of encountering a lion, and rightly so. You know, if I, if I, I think we joked about this at, at Review Preview one time. Like, if I told you that there is, if we got like some Whatcom County weather update, and they said, hey, there's a wild lion on the prowl at 8, you know, 586 Birch Bay Linden Road, you know, spotted in a parking lot by the Wayside Chapel. Not many of us, we might like peer out the window, we might look, but we wouldn't venture too far out there, right? Dangerous, frightening, right? And yet, can you imagine all the confidence and in control that you would feel if you found out this lion, the king of all beasts, was on your side? And so bring on Jadis, bring on the evil queen. Think about this. This drums up ideas of this. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? So our God that's all powerful, that if we would stand before him just in our own sinfulness, we would have every reason to have our knees knock, but he gave his son for us. So now bring on, Jadis, bring on all the the hardships of the Narnian world, right? Because this God has been given for us. This is our God. This is who he is. He loves us. He's amazing. He didn't spare his own son, but he gave him up for us that he might graciously give us all things. The Lion of Judah, listen, is this. Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scrolls and its seven seals. Meaning, he is the one qualified one to bring all of creation to its intended end, to its greater end. And this is the God that is on our side. We're not on his side. He is on our side, according to Paul. That's how much he graciously, mercifully loves us. So, he is the only qualified one to bring all things to their greater end. We need to recover in awe of the prominence of who our God is because this is what the greater end will look like. Now, this will be sobering. Listen to this, but the Apostle Paul talks about what that greater end will look like when we get into 2 Thessalonians. This is the evidence of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God, for which you are also suffering, 
since indeed God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you. Okay, well, what does that look like? And to grant relief to you who are afflicted, as well as to us when the Lord Jesus Christ is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will suffer the punishment of the eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might when he comes on that day to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled out among all those who have believed because our testimony to you was believed. People, this is the sobering end. When he comes, he will either grant relief or he will inflict vengeance. Talk about the ultimate would-you-rather game, right? When our God, the most prominent, comes again, he will either grant you relief from all the hardships, suffering, and troubles and afflictions that you faced, or he will inflict vengeance on you because you have chosen not to believe who he actually is. Those are the two options presented. This should sober us up. And when we read stuff like this, when I talk about in week two, like in order for our evangelistic and discipleship efforts to be in a healthy spot, we need to recover this. We need to have an awe of what our God says he will do soon, according to New Testament authors. I I don't want him to come and inflict vengeance on people that I love. So I need my heart to be captured be in awe of who our God is because I know he's going to come grant me relief. I want him to grant relief elsewhere too. So I want to go on a little journey with you and I want to trace this idea in Scripture that is, that's really amazing to me when I see it. And, it's, and the reason why we're going on this journey from Old Testament to the very end of our book is because we need to recover the prominence of our God. And so let's go back. It's pretty aggressive. It's pretty frightening. It's pretty terrifying. And I want to show you this theme as it unfolds throughout the scriptures. And it starts back in Exodus 19. Exodus 19, God is going to give the law to his covenant people. And so he's going to show up in a very dramatic, very frightening, terrifying way. And I like what what Richard said, is like, we can't just trifle with God. We can't just pretend like he's not a big deal. Read this and you'll see, oh, he is a big deal. When we trace this theme, you'll see he is a very big deal. So these are the instructions given to Moses. And this is God saying to him, And you shall set limits for the people all around, saying, Take care not to go up into the mountain or touch the edge of it. Why? Because God's getting ready to come down. Whoever touches the mountain, like if they, if they fail to do this, right? Whoever touches the mountain shall be put to death, but no one shall touch him, the man who died, but he shall be stoned or shot. Like, oh, <laughs> that's a big deal, right? Not with a musket, but with a bow and arrow, okay? Whether beast or man, he shall not live When the trumpet sounds a long blast, they shall come up to the mountain. And on the morning of the third day, there was thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast, so that all the people in the camp trembled. And then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God. And they took their stand at the foot of the mountain, like, oh my goodness. Don't get near You'll, you'll die, or we'll have to shoot you, right? Like, you know, caution tape around the whole thing. And they took their stand at the foot of the mountain because they're going to meet God. Now, Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke. Imagine Baker wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it in fire. The smoke of it went up like the smoke of a kiln, 
and the whole mountain trembled greatly. And as the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him in thunder. And the Lord came down on the Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. Here is, here is a mountain shrouded in smoke, fire. The whole mountain shook greatly, earthquake taking place, and God says, come on up. Who wants to be Moses in that moment? Right? Like, it's terrifying. Like, when I go up to Baker, I think, what if it blows? You know, like, I stand no chance. These boulders are massive. Like, it's awesome, but there's an awe there. It's like, any one of these could just fall and I'm dead, right? I don't know about you, but I really wouldn't want to be Moses. Seems a little bit risky. Like I know that I want to go behold God. There's something compelling drawing me up the mountain. But I know that if I would go up there, I, if, if, if God wouldn't somehow shield me from my own sinfulness, I would be consumed by him. I would need some sort of intercession, right? And think about this. In the fullness of time, there was another prophet of God who climbed up a hill to intercede on my behalf, and he himself was perfect, and yet he was smitten, afflicted, pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities, chastised, wounded, oppressed, and afflicted. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. Why? Because no one could ascend the mountain of God without clean hands and a pure heart. We hear echoes of this in Psalm 15. O oh Lord, who shall sojourn in your tent? Who shall dwell on your holy hill? Who can go up to meet with you like on the top of Mount Sinai? Only he who walks blamelessly and does what is right and speaks truth in his heart. And then the psalm goes on, so on and so forth. Although Jesus had never done anything wrong that we had, he assumed our sinfulness. And then we see Jesus acting like, not acting like, but actually becoming a substitute, being led like a lamb to the slaughter up a hill to be cut off from the land of the living. And Isaiah said it was the Lord's will to crush him. You can't come up here in your sinfulness. I will crush you. And when he was crushed and he breathed his last, after he ascended that hill of Golgotha, do you know what happened? What happened to the earth? Do you remember? It split. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice, and he yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two, and from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split. It's echoing back to what happened in Exodus 19. The next time we see an earthquake in Scripture, you don't have to go far. It's chapter 28 when the centurion and those who are with him keeping watch over Jesus saw the earthquake and what took place on resurrection morning. They were filled with awe and said, truly this was the Son of God. And behold, there was a great earthquake, resurrection morning, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. The earthquake and the centurion said, man, we just saw God. Surely this was the Son of God. But instead of them dying while they're on that hill, like those who would have touched the mountain of God in Moses' day while the law was being given initially, instead of the Roman centurion and all those people on the hill dying, Jesus died in their place. A substitution had occurred, and the earth quaked, which was more than likely indicating to us that the initial law of God that had been given on that mountain long ago had been ultimately fulfilled. And the next time you read about earthquake is on resurrection morning here. On resurrection morning, the, there's a great earthquake. Resurrection morning, there was a whole new creation being brought about. 
The whole new creation was being shaken into existence. A whole new creation had come. And the next time, you know where we see earthquake in Scripture? Do you know when it is? What would happen next? For those of you that read your Bibles. Right? When is it? At Pentecost. Yes! The next time we see the earth shaking in Scripture is when God comes down as Holy Spirit, in the presence of the Holy Spirit, right? The coming of the Holy Spirit to empower Jesus' disciples to proclaim the message of the requirements of God being fulfilled in Christ. So we read about it in Acts 4. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. God was validating their message. You know when it happens again? Later on in Acts chapter 16, and suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. Paul and Silas were in jail, and and then this earthquake happens and they're released. And immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bonds were unfasted. An earthquake not only released Paul and Silas from the Philippian prison, but it also authenticated their testimony. What happened? The jailer who witnessed the event recognized what? It was the Lord's hand at work. And what did he do? He believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and he was saved. Like, what is it going to take for God to like get our attention? Let me just shake this earth. Wake up. Look who I am. And the most sobering earthquake we're going to read about, the greatest earthquake that will occur in our history as a planet will occur in association with the seventh bowl of judgment at a place called Armageddon. We read about it in Revelation 16. It's known in Scripture as the Armageddon earthquake or the Messiah's earthquake will be associated with the return of Christ. Let's soberly read this passage of Scripture. And they assembled them at the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were flashes of lightning. What does that remind you of? Exodus 19. Rumblings, peals of thunder, and a great earthquake such as there had never been since man was on the earth. So great was that earthquake. It's like, John is like, he's like, it's a great earthquake such as there's never been since man was on the earth. By the way, so great was that earthquake. The great city was split into three parts and the cities of the nations fell and God remembered Babylon, the great to make her drain the cup of the wine of his fury, of his wrath. And the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet who was in his presence had done these signs by which he had deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who had worshipped his image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur. So let's recap this. The earth rocks and quakes when God descended on Mount Sinai. The earth rocked and quaked when Jesus died on Golgotha's hill. The earth rocks and quakes as the Spirit, well, first of all, it rocks and quakes as Jesus rises again and was given all authority in heaven and on earth. It rocks and quakes as the Spirit empowers witnesses who will testify to what they knew to be true about Jesus. It rocks and quakes to release Paul and Silas from prison that led to the salvation of the jailer and authenticated their message. And it will rock and quake when Jesus returns again. This is what it tells me. When God shows up, he shakes things up. And think about this. If you're here and we're trying to cultivate a healthy fear of God, He might need to shake you up a little bit. But when He shakes you, He's doing this to set things right in your life, to recreate you after His very own image. And He might need to shake a few things up in your life to set things in order, but when He shows up 
again, a second time, he is going to really, really shake things up. And at that moment, you will be very grateful if you're in him that you will have been receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken or destroyed. We looked at this last week. Let us be grateful that we're receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And that, do you see the trace, the theme? You can be a part of a kingdom that when everything else is shaking and quaking and falling into destruction and being thrown into lakes of fire alive, you can be grateful that you're part of a kingdom that cannot be shaken, right? And then let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and what? Awe. Oh, for our God is a consuming fire. Amen? The only proper response to these truths is worship. Wholehearted, obedient worship. Recovering that awe of who our God is and discovering his prominence. And so I'm going to turn us loose into a little bit of a discussion group here just for a few minutes. But I just want to talk about three different healthy benefits of the fear of the Lord. Um, like I said, I like to give you these every week. We could, we could go on and on and on, but here's just three more. Proverbs 14, 26, In the fear of the Lord, one has strong confidence, and his children will have a refuge. Man, if you're a parent, that's a good one. Proverbs 14, 27, the next one. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life, that one may turn away from the snares of death. A fountain of life? Sounds good to me. Proverbs 28, 14, last one. Blessed is the one who fears the Lord always, but whoever hardens his heart will fall into calamity. It's the ultimate would you rather game, right? Would you like to be blessed or would you want to harden your heart and fall into calamity? Man, don't choose that route. So you have three or four discussion questions there that you can look at at your tables. I'm just going to kind of turn you loose into having some of those discussions and... Um, and thanks for being here. Next week is our prayer time, so I'm going to let you go ahead and discuss at your tables those questions.